This week on CrossFeed. Salvation from homosexuality and Sarah Palin. Can self-help help yourself? What order were the books of the Bible written in? And Jesus versus the Terminator. Dale doing a real bad impression of Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. <laughs> I'm Pastor Jim Butler out in beautiful Boston, Massachusetts, and I'm not even going to try and do that. <laughs> How you been, Jim? Hey, we've been good. Last week, I don't know if anybody noticed, I was really out of it when we were doing this. I was just so tired. and um, I, I Friday night, I went to bed about 10.30 and woke up about 12 hours later on Saturday. I was up for um, about 8 hours and went to bed about 10 o'clock that night. Yeah, well, about 12 hours, went to bed about 10 or 10.30 that night. I and mean, finally caught up on everything, so uh, I was just exhausted. So if anybody thought I looked a little loopy or was real quiet last week, it's just, my brain was was fried. Well, I hope that the audio got weird after the um, after we played those video clips, too. I don't know what happened with that. So apologies for that, anybody who watched last week's episode. So I had a fascinating day today. I went to – I spent my afternoon – at a conference that was sponsored by our local uh, hospice chapter. And uh, it was called, Because You Haven't Died Before, The World of the Dying. And it was a grief counseling uh, lecture, but it was focused not on ministering to the survivors, but ministering to the dying. And, and it was just, I mean, it was wonderful. Uh, this, she's, uh, author, um, a female ELCA pastor, uh, from, um, New Jersey. And I guess she's written a book by that title too. So, um, if, you know, if you have a chance to, to check out her stuff, fascinating, just absolutely wonderful. And, um, on that note, I also had sort of an epiphany. Um, while I was sitting there, um, is something I've been thinking about a lot lately and I'm not sure why, but it it seems like things just sort of fell into place to make it happen. Um, and and, and it's two things. Uh, first of all that, all right, now being a pastor of the Lutheran church, Missouri Synod, um, we don't believe that God intends for women to be pastors. All right. Now, some of you will agree with that and some of you will disagree with that. Okay. But we believe that according to what the Bible says, that that's the case. Right. But at the same time, I'm listening to this woman. I know other women pastors and I know that these people bring Christ to people. All right. They share the gospel with people. You know, they, do good work, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, and, and the thing is, I've probably, if somebody had, had said something like this to me in the past, I would have said, yes, that's right. But it's just something that I never really thought through. But once I actually did think it through, it made perfect sense to me. And, and that is this. And, and I would love feedback from our uh, listeners and viewers on this. Okay. And here's, here is sort of what I've come to understand. When someone brings the gospel to someone else, regardless how they're doing it, regardless whether they're doing it in a proper way, they're still doing a good thing, All right? They're still, it may not be, it, there may, it may be tainted by sin. But that doesn't mean that God can't work through the gospel being presented by this person. And it doesn't mean that they're not, and this is the tricky part, it doesn't mean that they're not doing the Lord's work. 
It just may be that they're not doing it in the way that he intended that particular person to do it. Oh, very nice plane. Does that make sense? Paul says, I think it's in Philippians 1, that uh, you know some people preach the gospel out of envy and other people do it to make him miserable, but he was thankful that the gospel is being preached regardless. So, I think that's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. And it also reminds me of uh, when the disciples went out and, uh, and they said, oh, we caught a guy casting out demons in your name and we told him to stop. And, uh, and Jesus says, no, if, if they're not against us, they're for us. Now, of course, later on he says, if they're not for us, they're against us, but that was in a different context. You know, in this case, this guy may not have had all the right information in that, but he was still pro-Jesus. My own view has always been um, that women should not be pastors. But I've met a lot of men who shouldn't be pastors either. <laughs> True. As I've, you know, said on here, I, I mean, I've met men who are occupying the, the pastoral office who deny the resurrection. And uh, so, with that in mind, sometimes it brings you up some questions. But I've met I've met some neat uh, clergy women women in my day. Uh, some of them who. Um, have been overall fairly biblical. Um, I remember when I was doing my doctorate at Gordon Conwell, and there was a woman there, and she was evangelical. She was, I think, Presbyterian. And uh, so she asked me one time, she said, well, Jim, what do you think about women being pastors? I looked at her and said, you're Presbyterian, aren't you? She goes, yeah. I said, if you had enough issues just being Presbyterian. <laughs> <laughs> no. She goes, seriously. I said, I don't think women should be pastors. So that's why I'm part of the Missouri Senate. Do you think they should be? That's why you're part of PCUSA. Let's just agree to disagree and move on. So I would love, you know, normally we say this at the end, but I would love to hear feedback. Um, do you agree? Do you disagree? Um, you know, what do you think about this? And uh, so you can send us an email at podcast at crossfeednews.com. Or if you'd like to have a uh, more of a discussion uh, specifically with me, you can uh, catch me on Twitter at uh, at twitter.com slash CrossFeed News. So. Good. Where should we start tonight? Oh, wait. I have one more. This is, this is sort of, oh. I think, connected with that. Or at least it happened around the same time. All right. Um, with theology, you know, we talk about milk and meat. And milk is the stuff that's kind of easy to swallow. It's the, you know, for those who are um, infants in the faith. And, you know, and, and probably the, um, uh, the, like the Apostles' Creed, you know, and the, the, what, the sort of basics in there, that would probably be considered milk. Okay. And then the meat is the stuff that, boy, you got to chew on that for a while. It's pretty hard to swallow. And, and so you've got to spend some time, you know, with that. And it requires you to be a little more mature and to, you know, have, cut your teeth on some theology first and stuff. And um, so, but I've come to realize also there's another category of theology. And this is, again, one of those things that I knew but just never really thought about. And these are the things that you have to chew on and chew on and chew on, and you may never swallow them. You just, you might never be able to really wrap your head around it, at least till you get to heaven. And so I'm calling that theological gum, right? You just keep on chewing on it. And it's fun to chew on. Um, it can get kind of frustrated because after a while it might lose its flavor. <laughs> uh, but I, so, so that's, this is another thing. This is, all these thoughts are kind of raw uh, because I just thought of them this afternoon and I had all these other thoughts going through my head at the same time. So, um, you know, they probably need to be honed a little bit, but yes, theological gum. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to trademark that or something. <laughs> yeah. Theological mush. Anyway, um, where should we begin? Um, let's, let's, speaking of, we're talking about the Bible and, um, so let's talk about this new Bible. Um, the Chronological Study Bible is what it's called. And um, the story from the Washington Post. Uh, 
Now, you know, the funny thing is, I, I thought I remember seeing something like this sometime when I was in college, but I, I didn't pick it up at the time. But the idea is, is um, the author, or the editor, uh, his name is Bob Sanford, and he is attempting to put together a study Bible in which the things that are written are in chronological order. Mm-hmm. And so it'd be interesting to see. Um, uh, but I guess it doesn't quite work the way I was, I was really kind of hoping. Um, it says, uh, you know, uh, uh, it reorders the, the, the it uh, rejiggers the order of books, psalms, and gospels to provide a historical framework. For example, whole sections of Isaiah and Nehemiah are reordered to better reflect an accurate historical timeline. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are merged into one based on Mark's chronology. Some of Paul's letters are woven into the book of Acts. Now, partly this is a good idea. When I teach my New Testament course, we cover Paul's books, for example, in the book of Acts. So we, you know, get, you know, here's I say, okay, now we're gonna take a look at Galatians, or now we're gonna take a look at Romans, or now we're taking a look at now we're gonna take a look at uh, First Thessalonians. This is when he wrote it to to put it in context. Um, to a certain extent, it would be neat to take, for example, like the book of Second Kings uh, or First Kings, and when uh, we have King Ahaz, Uzziah, and Ahaz when Isaiah was preaching. And to be able to put in right then, you know, some of Isaiah's um, prophecies in uh, Kings, it talks about the, the Pekka and Rezin and their attack on Jerusalem. And that's, of course, when the great uh, Isaiah 7, uh, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 were, were written. So it'd be kind of neat to tie those in or, or right after you have David mucking it up with Bathsheba to have the 50, Psalm 51 there. Mm-hmm. So to a certain extent, some of that's kind of neat. Um, however, they mentioned that um, some of it, though, is a little bit murkier, um, you know. Or also in Second King, Second Kings, when Jeremiah is doing his preaching, and some of the other uh, uh, um, minor prophets might be kind of fun. But I'm not sure they're going to do that. I'm not sure they can put those minor prophets in or Jeremiah, you know, where, where they're supposed to be. Yeah. But yeah. some of the stuff's a little bit murkier. Um, which came first, Ezra and Nehemiah? I mean, that's one issue. Uh, was the temple built first or were the walls built first? How do you date Job? Uh, yeah, how do you date Job? There's a second. Uh, there's a section there in Ezra which really is is dated late. That that letter that they write, you know, that that that's recognized as being like a generation later. Um, and I'm not sure. I mean, you can try to harmonize the Gospels. I'm not sure you can fully pull it off. I, you know, I've been able... I, I actually heard uh, this speaker today um, say something to the effect of there's four different accounts of the, of the Easter, of the resurrection, and um, and they're, they're very different accounts, and she even lumped in, you know, P- Gospels of Peter and Thomas, right? Um which I would disagree with. She sort of gave those a little more credibility than they really do. But I've actually sat down and harmonized the, um, when I was in high school, I did this because I heard that they contradicted each other. And so I sat down with all four of them. Uh, not much to Mark really, but, um, but I sat down with all four of them and harmonized them and it works. Oh, yeah, I think you can do it. It's a little tricky here and there, I think. Um, you know, some of them try to figure out exactly, you know, uh, because Luke says all the women appeared to the disciples and Peter ran out and John has just Martha going to them and Peter and John running out. Well, obviously that Peter and John running the tomb is the same thing as Luke, but I'm not sure how, unless Martha was kind of the chief spokesperson there. Well, yeah, it's sort of like, um, you know, if I say I have a daughter, that's true. If I say I have three daughters, that's also true. You know, so um, if you leave a few people out of the story or, you know, or something like that, there's a few places like that where sometimes one guy's mentioned, sometimes 
two were mentioned or, you know, or something like that. But that just means that the other guy was ignored in that particular narrative. So that's not really a right. problem. But, um, so some of it's, you know, some, it's sometimes kind of hard to fit together. Um, you know, uh, uh, some of the stuff that's in, in that, that's in Mark and, uh, Matthew, Luke's and, Luke and Matthew's gospel, uh, what some people refer to as Q narratives. Um, you know, they're in two different places. Is that because Jesus taught it twice, or is that because, you know, Matthew purposely structured his gospel to put it less historically? Yeah, Matthew seemed to lump ideas more together. I was kind of surprised, because I would think you would go with Luke as the... I I always thought that Luke was the most um, kind of chronological of all of them. I know, uh, either Luke or Matthew. Luke or Mark is considered more chronological. Um, Matthew is definitely much more thematic in his uh, arrangement of the gospel. But... um, even some of the stuff in the Old Testament, you, you, it's kind of hard to, you know, figure some of this exactly out. Uh, you're going to have to completely reorder the book of Jeremiah. Because it's obvious that some of the stuff going on in Jeremiah is, uh, you know, at the end, of, towards the end of the book, he talks about Zedekiah, who was, you know, Right after Josiah, so really, if you can do it chronologically, that section needs to go up to the front of the book. Yeah, it's kind of in the flashback and, and stuff. So yeah. the thing is, now this or, article, uh, though, What are you going to do with article, Isaiah 40 to 66? Uh, is that going to go post-exilic? Or? Well, yeah, and okay, this is the problem that we run into, is because what, what do you do with all these prophecies? All right, do you put it with when it was fulfilled? Or do you put it, you know, in that case, you're going to put a bunch of Isaiah in the New Testament? But, um, or, you know, or do you put it with when it was written? And, um, and now, that's a big question. You run, and then you run into the problem in the article. And the article seems to be kind of skewed um, against, uh, should we say, scriptural inerrancy. Um, it, because it, it seems to be kind of skewed <laughs> against. I was trying to be gentle. <laughs> Um, you know, I mean, it's it, uh, it's definitely against, and uh, which is not unusual for articles in the Washington Post. I've got several of them that just kind of buy into higher critical thought, and uh, you know, wholeheartedly don't not no question. And um, it, it's, it's interesting because yeah, they they interview several professors. One at Stonehill College in Easton, Mass. Uh, one. Um, uh, can't remember where the other guys were, but I mean, uh, there's, there's not an evangelical in the bunch. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. So if you're going to talk to the guy from Easton, you might as well go on up to, to, um, Gordon Conwell and talk to one of them. Yeah. See, so you've got, you know, they're talking about, um, take for example, the book of Jeremiah, which was written by an undetermined number of authors over an unknown period. All right. No, that's not true. That's, that's just based on this higher critical thinking, um, basically the idea that the Bible evolved, um, which, you know, do you believe that it's God's word or not? And if you do, then when it says it's Isaiah wrote Isaiah and Jeremiah wrote, I wrote Jeremiah, then that's the way it is. And the thing is, there's no reason to think otherwise. I mean, they're, um, th- these books work in themselves. Um, most of the, these assumptions started out with the idea that, uh, well, Isaiah couldn't have possibly written, uh, some of the stuff at the end because he mentioned Cyrus by name and Cyrus didn't live until after, um, after Isaiah was dead. So how could, how could he have known about this? Well, <laughs> duh, it's prophecy, you know, but, you know, when you want to take the supernatural, when you want to take God out of the Bible, you're not left with much. Yeah, I like this Pat Graham from Emory University who said, um, it's like you would attach a pack of cigarettes with a warning label from the Surgeon General. Well, this Bible should have a warning from the Theologian General or something. This Bible may be harmful to your spiritual health. I'm really not sure why. <laughs> I mean, it's not like a chronology of the Gospels has not existed before. I mean, there's, there's several of those out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not like um, other people haven't tried to, to 
to to you know fit things together. I mean, even the Bible itself, to a certain extent, does, as it talks about. Um, you know, when it get when when the uh, prophets talk about, here's the kings who were alive when I did my prophesying. And, right. You know, and, and or Jeremiah again. To, you know, in the days of Zedekiah, this was said, so that you know it fits back to Zedekiah. But yeah, but if, but if you take the, the the underlying assumption that there are multiple authors. Yeah. Then, yeah, of course you're going to have that kind of viewpoint. Now, I have right here, this is the Bible that my daughter uses for confirmation class. And um, it's the day-to-day kids' Bible, read the Bible in a year, seven minutes a day. And um, I want to read a portion of the um, the Dear Adult Friends preface. Uh, it says... It's my hope that this book will help your child get to know God better. In one year, your child can have an in-depth overview of God's story from creation through John's revelation. It can be accomplished in about seven minutes a day by following the daily readings, two or three pages each. Stories are written in the order in which they occurred. For example, David's Psalms are placed with stories about his life. The Gospels are combined to tell the story of Jesus' life as a whole. Paul's letters are placed between chapters and acts during the time period in which he wrote them. To keep the text interesting and meaningful, some passages have been excluded. Those including genealogies, repetitive passages, parts of long speeches, detailed laws and rituals, extremely abstract and symbolic passages, sexual scenes, and graphic violence. So, um... So this is great. Take all the fun stuff out. <laughs> yeah, but at the same time, when my daughter's reading it, you know, I don't want to read about Joe or about uh, 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 Lot and his daughters, you know, <laughs> or the, you know, the the what was it when um when they they cut the guy up and or no, who was it where they they cut him up and and delivered their parts to the um. The guy cuts up his concubine in the end of Judges. Yeah, yeah. So, you know. Twelve pieces out. She'd have a hard time with that. But it reminds me kind of uh, the children's uh, Bible stories when I was a kid. And uh, uh, and it said, you know, talking about Joseph. Joseph is accused of doing something wrong, something that was very bad he should not do. And he was in jail, and I always thought he was accused of stealing something or something. And, uh, you know, I showed her the Bible as a freshman in high school, and I go, Oh, <laughs> you think he's right? Okay. Um, See, with this one though, wants- it's not just stories though. I mean, it is. They use the actual text. Now they they took like um, instead of glory and grace, like um, greatness and kind love. Um, mm-hmm. Instead of tabernacle, it's worship tent, you know, and stuff like that. Um, and so they say uh, uh, Jews and Jewish people are used for God's people throughout the Old Testament instead of, you know, Israelites and all the different, you know, Hebrew and, and all that kind of stuff, just so the, the kids would understand. But, yeah, it's it's actually, um, it's it's not just stories. They, they did a pretty good job of it. It's, it's uh, just short of being a translation. So sell so, up. Uh- now you've had your product placement for tonight. You've you got your money, so we know. This one should be able to hit these plugs all the time, and, you know, he, I think he gets paid for them. Boy, wouldn't that be but nice? Is, <laughs> yeah. But is this really um, – well, let's move on. Let's talk. Let's go from one book to talk about another, about self-help books. And uh, there's a business professor out there, and his name, and that's his picture behind me, uh, Paul Damien is his name. He's a business professor at the University of Texas. And um, he basically just re- he has a new book called Help. And it just rips apart um, the self-help authors uh, such as Deepak Chopra, Rhonda Byrne, and Fritzoff Capra. I got a bad feeling about this. Uh, and accuses them of preying on people's fears for personal profit, and he just kind of tears apart, shows what the the, the you know the the um, techniques that they use in writing their books. We're in trouble. 
said, I read quite a few of them, and my initial disbelief turned into a burning desire to discredit and disprove these people. I felt that debunking the self-help book is a form of self-help. Well, he, he talked about uh, Chopra was, um, says he was already marketing guruism before he even wrote his first book. He was a follower of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, um, who was one of the biggest intellectual con artists of the time. He, he's the guy that uh, came up with Transcendental Meditation. And uh, he said Chopra was a salesman. He made his first couple million dollars selling Yogi's products. He copyrighted the word Ayurveda, and he marketed all these products under the guise of healing and youthfulness. From there, it was easy for him to get into the mainstream of self-help gurus. Then he appeared on Oprah, and his book sold like 130,000 copies in an hour. Yeah, he, he, he goes after Oprah a couple times in this article. Is the burning desire to turn a systematic study of the method used to generate a successful Oprah quality bestseller. And what sets the bestsellers apart? Clever marketing. Yeah, pretty much. I'm telling you, it's just clever marketing. These books are a dime a dozen. The ones that make it have good marketing. Well, you know, if you look at books like, uh, what's the, the popular one now? The Secret. Um, Oprah's a huge fan of that. Um, and, but really the secret is, and now I haven't read it. Okay. I'll, I'll preface it with that. Uh, I've got better things to do with my time. Um, but I've, I've read enough reviews of it's, uh, uh, both positive and negative to understand that basically it's just rehashed new age theology, which is rehashed Hinduism. So, um, you know, nothing new under the sun. If you... It, it, but it, you know, of course, you mix it in with. Yeah, you know, I I tell my kids, you know, there's I've told them tonight, you can do anything you want if you want to do it bad enough, you're willing to work at it. And um, it's something that my dad taught me. It's something I teach my kids, and um, and, and I believe I think it's you know it's an American idea. It's not necessarily a scriptural thing, um, but you know these guys kind of take that the next step. Or at least the secret does, um, you know. That says not. It's this just. You can have anything you want if you believe it enough. You know, and the thing is, then you got people like um, Joel Osteen and stuff like that that practically say that. Yeah, I was wondering if he was going after Joel Osteen in his book there. You know, uh, your best life now and. If, you know, that was, uh, you know, one of the books he was going after, uh, and it, uh, it, I thought it was just a kind of interesting idea how he just, but I, you know, you read enough of these guys and they all do sound kind of the same after a while. Mm -hmm. And they all do kind of focus on the same type of thing and it's, but you know what it is, it, you know, it is self-help. It is, it's all directed to the self. There's, there's no, a direction of looking for help by looking to God. It's all just looking at yourself. Yep. You can do it. You can do it. It's it's very it's very law focused. You know. Right. What do I need to do to be saved? Or you know, however you define salvation. And what was a, your little phrase there? You could do it. You can do it. Remind me of the after ABC after school special. You can do it, Duffy Moon. You know, he reads his self-help book and he finds it goes to find the author and the guy's like, I just wrote the book to make money, kid. You know, I don't really believe that stuff. <laughs> uh, let's go from him. Well, uh, the, 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 our last two stories are kind of connected in a, in a way. Uh, so let's go over. Let, let's go to your Arnold here. Uh, um, you, you, you can talk. Now, I've never watched the Sarah Connor Chronicles. I've never, I, I confess I've never watched a Terminator movie. You've so never watched a Terminator I've never, movie? I've never watched a Terminator movie. <sighs> I don't like violence. No, he doesn't like violence. That's why he reads Batman and Superman. <laughs> Well, it's one thing to to see pictures. It's you know another thing to see it acted out. Yeah, because those movies are so realistic. <laughs> you know, but uh, you know, I just I've never watched. I'm sorry. So you're going to have to um, pontificate here, Dale, and and say whether or not Sarah 
here is um, not the one from Alaska, but if she's supposed to be Mary and uh, her son there is supposed to be Jesus. Okay. Um, I wouldn't know the first thing about this, this the series, so. All right, well, I haven't watched the Sarah Connor. Now, by the way, I might. I might if one of them had a big red S that they had, okay? Part of the chest, <laughs> but. Um, because I, I haven't had a chance to watch it because it's on at the same time as a couple of the other shows that I watch. And so I can, my DVR can only record two shows at a time. I have the pilot on my, um, in my iTunes library. I haven't gotten around to watching it yet. And I think you can catch them on like Hulu.com or something like that. Um, and I haven't had time to do that either. But I am familiar with the premise because I've seen all three Terminator movies. And by the way, there's another one coming out. Um, in fact, there's another trilogy coming out. So, um, but basically the, for those, uh, who haven't seen the movies and for Jim, um, the, the Terminator series, there's, uh, uh, in the future, the machines have taken over. They've artificial intelligence has gotten to the point where they've actually become self-aware and said, why should we serve humanity? Why shouldn't we make humanity serve us? And, um, and it becomes this, you know, horrible thing for people. They become slaves and, and all this stuff. Well, this guy, John Connor leads a resistance and overcomes them. So the machines send a Terminator, which is a robot, um, back in time to kill his mother before he's born, thereby preventing him from leading the resistance to overthrow them. And so, um, so really these movies are all about protecting the first one is about protecting his mother so that he can be born. And then the next one, he's a kid and, uh, uh, another Terminator that's a more advanced one comes back and, um, and tries to kill him as a kid. And then finally, um, in the third one, uh, even more advanced one comes and tries to kill him as an adult. Um, right at the, about the time where this is about to happen, where this, it's uh, called Cyberdyne, um, it, this artificial intelligence becomes aware. And, uh, and he's, and at the end, he's unable to stop it. And, um, the, it's, he's, he, he tries to, because he knows about it in advance, and so he tries to stop it from happening in the first place. Um, but he's unable to stop it. So you get this whole destiny thing. Um, so now taking this idea, all right, especially the first movie where you're, um, you have, and, and the, in the, the movies he's, uh, or I'm sorry, in the TV show, he's like a kid or a, a um, teenager or something like that. And, um, so it would take place between the, Second and third. Maybe somebody who's watched it could probably give us some more information. So I apologize for that. Um, but she's trying to protect her son because he is going, he's destined to be the salvation of mankind. All right. Well, translate that to Jesus. You've got Mary and Joseph, of course. Um, but his mother is not Sarah Connors. His mother is not married. Um, which is you find out about that in the first movie, how that happens. Um, and you need to watch a movie to find out how that happens <laughs> <laughs> to find out who his father is. Um, oh, okay. I <laughs> yeah. It was kind of like, you know, uh, Barack Obama talking about one of his daughters accidentally becoming pregnant. And I'm just like, how does that happen in an accident? No. <laughs> So and, well, I just walk along there, and then you know, this is accident happened. You know, next thing I knew, <laughs> get hit by a car, and <laughs> ended up pregnant. <laughs> so I was, I was just trying to figure to figure that line out there. Okay, so, um, so you know, this is this sort of brings to mind the um, when Mary and Joseph took the toddler uh, Jesus to Egypt. For a little while until King Herod died, 
to protect him so that to spare his life so mm-hmm. that he could become the savior of mankind. And, you know, so there's definitely a, um, whether it was originally intentional or not, I don't know. Um, but there, you know, there's, there's definitely a sense of that sort of Christ figure. I mean, he's definitely a Christ figure, but how much of a, I don't think it was really intended to be an allegory. Um, but there is a, this is, this is an interview uh, from Comic Con. Well, and, and and this general, the uh, guy, he, I, he's one of the um, producers. I mean, he says it's very very honest. He says, uh, "I think Mary is a very very radicalized Mary figure, and John is a sort of the Jesus figure has always been in the franchise, and it's stuff that thematically is interesting to explore." So um, you know. It's it, you know he 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 insists that 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 has always been part of it. Um, it's not an uncommon thing in literature overall, and or it's particularly in um, um, science fiction literature. Yep. Yeah, and we've talked about that a lot in previous episodes. Um. So you know it's it's interesting you know it. it Honestly, I, it's not a connection that I made in the past, so it would be interesting to go back and watch the movies, or or the series for that matter, and, um, you know, kind of with that in mind. He's definitely very different. It's This is not an allegory here, you know. I mean, he doesn't sacrifice himself to save mankind. Uh, he's kind of... Unwill, it's like, well, this is my destiny, so I have to do it. Um, but it's not, you know, it's it's not like Jesus. <laughs> there, there's there's definitely no. I know there's no other way, Father. You know, or you know, if there's another way, take this cup for me, kind of thing. Um, you know, there or possibly a sense of regret, like, man, why did this have to be my destiny? But then again, just. You know the attitude that he has and everything. It 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 works. He's a he's a good character for it. But you know this is a, this is someone who is not afraid to use violence uh, to accomplish what he wants. It's it's not a matter of by his death humanity is saved. You know. So, um, but there's another trilogy coming out. So, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to to see how that goes. Uh, the new trilogy is sort of an alternate future. It takes place in the future, but it starts out something like, this is not the future that my mother told me about. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that goes and how much of a, a, a um, sort of Christ parallel there is there. Be quiet and watch the film. Sorry. Um, speaking of Sarah. Well, should we go yeah, speaking of Sarah, <laughs> let's go. Let's talk about the the other Sarah there. Uh, at least, really not her. Really, more about her church this time. And there it is, sitting behind me. That is uh, Australia Bible Church. And uh, this is um, um, they are having a work on a a, a workshop on. Um, to convert gays into heterosexual behavior through the power of prayer. There, or as, as they say, pray away the gay. <laughs> <laughs> Was that, I didn't see that in here. Uh, I saw it in another oh, article. Yeah, okay. Yeah, or, no, oh, yeah, yeah, there it is. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, it's interesting. Um, says uh, Palin campaigning with McCain has not publicly expressed a view on it, and the senior pastor um, was not available to discuss the matter on Friday when they call, when when Associated Press called. But this is a focus on the family love one out um, conference. These things have been all over the place, and every time they are, they every time they have one, it gets protested, and you know, and and, and people get all upset about it. Um. But, you know, they, they help some people, um, mm-hmm. you know, quite a few. I mean, they're, I don't know what their percentage is or, you know, or whatever, but, um, 
there's a lot of people who are, you know, heavily involved in the uh, homosexual lifestyle that end up uh, leaving it. Um, they end up getting married and, and having happy marriages and, mm-hmm. and considering themselves mm-hmm. heterosexual. Yeah, and, and oh, the, the church is not hosting it. The church is merely promoting it. Uh, it actually will be held uh, in, uh, over in Anchorage, about 30 miles away. Um, okay. Here's the question. I'm waiting! It doesn't matter what her personal belief in this issue is. So long as she's willing as vice president, or if McCain were to die, president enforces the laws as written. That's really, you know, you know, that's, that's really what it comes, you know, that's really to me the more important issue. Um, you know, it says, um, you know, uh, Early on, uh, um, she supported a bill to overrule a court decision to block state benefits for gay partners. Um, however, later on, the, the state attorney general said, well, you know, it's unconstitutional. So she vetoed the bill. So whether she personally agreed with the law or not, you know, she followed what the ruling had to be. And that's that's where I, I get to wondering, and, 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 you know, the whole issue of homosexuality is one thing. And we can talk about that if, if you want. But then the other side of it is, you know, are you willing to enforce the laws as written and be the leader of all people, even people that you may disagree with? You will unite or you will fall. Yeah, that's uh, when I'm the, uh, you know, and... and, and you know, I, I often wonder if, you know, what would happen if, for example, if, you know, somebody pro-life became governor of Massachusetts, which, you know, you know, I, you know, the Supreme Court could, you know, do a 9-0 turn, you know, turnover Roe v. Wade tomorrow, ain't going to change this state. Yeah, well... Okay, I guess Romney wasn't really pro-life at the time, was he? It's kind of hard to say. I think he was, but he also said basically, you know, I'm not going to make a big deal of it because I know it's not going to go anywhere in this state. Which, frankly, if I was the governor, that's what I'd say too. I mean, you know, what? why, why spend my time pushing and trying to over, you know, trying to pass laws that I know aren't going to go anywhere in the legislature. Yeah. I yeah. mean, that's... Just, so, you know, you know the I thing mean, is, the, the other thing with this one is that it's not even her church. <laughs> this is the church she true. grew up in. <laughs> but we talked about last time, this isn't her church. So it's like, you know, on the one hand, the, the, you, I keep... Half the headlines that I'm seeing are Palin's pastor problems. You know, like, this isn't her pastor. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, you know, like with Obama, it was his pastor. Jeremiah Wright was his pastor. But this guy is not, and this is not her church. She's not a member of this church anymore. She used to be, but she left it. You know? Yeah, she was there for about six years, it says. So, I don't know. It's kind of goofy. I mean, as, as far as the, the conferences themselves, you know what? They help a lot of people. They're completely voluntary. The people that go to these are the people that want help. They want out of the gay lifestyle. Mm-hmm. This, these, they do not um, push these on anybody that's not interested. But they're saying, look, if you're gay or you have these tendencies, you know, you have this attraction and you don't want to because you believe that the Bible says that, um, that this, this is sin. Then we want to help you and see if through counseling, prayer, what have you, that 
you know, that we can help you have the heterosexual lifestyle that you want. And, you know, I always hear um, homosexuals say, well, nobody chooses to be gay. Who would choose to be gay? Well, if you have a way out of it, because you're tired of, you know, even if you don't think it's wrong, but you're just tired of the persecution, man, my life would be so much easier if, you know, if I weren't. Okay, well, you know, here's a here's some, somebody offering to help you out of that, and if you, you know, if you want the, um, you know, two point eight children or whatever, and the picket fence house and all that kind of stuff, you know, here's here's it's being offered to you, you know, and uh, and you know, for some people, it doesn't it doesn't help them. It's it's sort of like a stop smoking seminar. It's going to help some people, other people it's not. So, you comparing being gay to stopping smoking, man? We're going to get we're going to get emails. Dale, Dale, remember <laughs> Iowa? <laughs> hey, I, no, I, you know. this is something that that though that the Mormon guy that that's been watching our shows. By the way, he didn't respond to the our last episode, but. Um, this is something he would probably agree with me on. So there you go. Now I'm agreeing with the Mormons. <laughs> and both your wives are too. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, couldn't read this. We do have the one woman who said for snarky. I guess we still are. So uh, didn't mean to be offensive there, but could, couldn't couldn't resist it when he threw that line in. But uh, you know, it's. Uh, you know, I think some people have a desire to follow a, a, a straight lifestyle. I think some people it is possible. Um, my problem is my problem is those who say all gay people can become straight, and those who say none of them can become straight. That's not quite true. I know, I know some guys who are celibate and still struggle uh, with their desires. Uh, flip side, I yeah, there are those people um, who you know once you know participated in that lifestyle and have left it. I did not know that. So, which leads us to our other story: you know, the train behind me. And the window's open, too, so it's going to be kind of loud. I apologize for that. Now, this is, a, I thought, a very interesting interview that was conducted by Christianity Today and it was found on their website. And it was a interview with uh, uh, Chad Allen. Now, Chad Allen was uh, is, is an openly gay um, actor. And he played the part of Nate Saint on the Jim Elliott movie, uh, The End of the Spear. Now, they, they chose him for the part, not knowing uh, about his orientation, not knowing that he was actually quite uh, out with it and had a partner that he had lived with for a number of years. And when they found out, he was like, look, I'd understand if you want to withdraw the part. And they're like, well, even though they didn't officially have a contract with him, they had made the officially the offer for him to play the part. And they're like, well, no, we, we, we offered you the part. Um, we need to keep our word. And we'll take whatever flack comes out of this. And so they filmed the, uh, uh, did the movie, The End of the Spear. And he was very impressed with the people he got to know there. Uh, he said, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, he said a number of, he, he met a number of evangelicals who object to his lifestyle, but have reached out to him in love and compassion. So he was, um, you know, that kindness, um, made him say, well, there could be a more productive conversation between evangelical Christians and the gay community. Now he had struggled with his orientation for years. He um, uh, was um, alcoholic. He was a substance abuser. He uh, wanted to kill himself at one point. 
Uh, he thought God hated him. He thought Christians hated him, all because of, uh, of his orientation. And so finding out that that wasn't necessarily true was really a big thing. So anyway, to, to advance the, the, the conversation, uh, he's made a movie called Save Me. And it deals with a, a, a gay young man named Mark, who's played by Chad Allen, um, goes to a, a place that they're in the movies called the Genesis House, which is apparently the um, reference to Exodus International, which is supposed to be a Christian ex-gay ministry uh, where he finds compassion, hope, sobriety, self-respect, and God. <laughs> but at the end of the film, he's still gay. <laughs> and he says, I think the premise of gay conversion is a false one. So he wouldn't go along with these Love One Out conferences? No, he wouldn't go with that. Um, but it was interesting that he really wanted to, um, you know, make something here that was going to promote dialogue. As a matter of fact, that when they first started, some people wanted to make it into a comedy. He's like, no, 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 no. That's not what I want. You know, yeah. we want to tell the, yeah. the truth and try to figure out a way to advance the conversation. Yeah, and, and he believes, uh, you know, he's not against these, um, like, Love One Out conferences and stuff like that. Because he says, yeah, they, they help people. I, you know, I don't think that it can convert a person from being gay, but it helps people to live the lifestyle that they want to live. So, you know, I don't, I don't, he says, I don't see a problem with it, which is kind of refreshing. You know, it's like, okay, whether you agree with it or not, people are happier because of it. So let them, you know, that's, I, I never understood uh, why people are so against these things. It's like nobody's forcing anybody to go to these. It's only for people that are looking for something like that. But, well, what the reason is, is because, you know, there's a belief that we should be absolutely upset, accepting of them. Well, yeah. Uh, well, and, and of their sin. I mean, is it a term and thought? No, it was Charles Peter Field, Porterfield Krauth, famous Lutheran, who once said, you know, first error wants acceptance, then it wants, uh, I mean, first wants tolerance, then acceptance, and then demands it's the only way. Yep, we're on step two there. Yeah, you know, so, yeah. So, uh, or, and heading into step three in some, some instances that, you know, um, I had a, a member of my church, and she's a psychiatrist, and uh, um, she was, you know, came to me about a situation and um, working with this guy in this hospital who was gay and, um, you know, and, and, and Pentecostal Christian. And everybody, you know, was trying to tell him, well, it's, it's okay, just just live it. He's like, no, 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 I can't do that. This isn't what God wants. I, I, you know, God doesn't want me to have these feelings. I keep praying that they be taken away and... So I finally asked her to deal with it because you know, she was Christian. You know, can you deal something deal with this guy? So she came in. She said, told me a little bit. Of, you know, just told me that much. I said, how? What should I do? I said, tell him he's forgiven. Yeah. I said, share the gospel with him. I said, he feels the law. He feels the guilt and the shame. He needs to know that God loves him unconditionally. And that, yeah, he is going to have these feelings and, and these things and he may not be freed from them. That may be his thorn in the flesh. But that the grace is always there for him. Yeah. You know, everybody's tempted by different things. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, for some people, it's it's uh, homosexuality. For other people, it's other kinds of sexual sin. Uh, I just heard uh, recently about a study that was done where they found a genetic link to um, men, at least in men who are unfaithful to their spouses, that there's actually something, <laughs> there's actually something in their genes that affects <laughs> it's in their genes. <laughs> um, and, uh, I'm not going there. <laughs> sorry. Um, but you know, the thing is, okay. I was gonna well, say, yeah. David well, Solomon, both of them had a bunch of wives. Yeah. It fits some, some, something, uh, yeah. And, that's, that, that's a joke. <laughs> well, the point is, is that 
you know, different people are tempted by different things. And it may be genetic. You know, we talk about inheriting sin. Now, I don't believe that sin could somehow be, you know, that you could use gene therapy to remove sin from someone. I think it's much deeper than that. But I don't think that we as Christians should be surprised if we believe that we inherit sin, that, um, that it would affect our, you know, that it would run so deep as to affect our genetic makeup. Um, I would say that that would be a symptom of sin, not the cause of sin. Um, but you know, it, it doesn't surprise me at all. So, you know, and I've, I've talked about this on the show before, if, if they find, a um, you know, there's still a lot of debate about whether homosexuality is uh, genetic or not. And you know what, if they find a genetic link, that wouldn't surprise me at all. But there's also a genetic link to alcoholism. And, um, that doesn't mean that it's okay to, um, you know, it, it, it's something that you need to get under control if you have that tendency. But, you know, at the same time, people make such a big deal about this. And yes, it's a big deal, okay? Um, sexual sin in particular is, is something um, that is, it can be extremely destructive. And, um, and, and can really get in the way of our relationship with God. And, and I've talked in previous episodes about why uh, homosexuality is sin, because uh, marriage is God's uh, sort of reflection of his relationship with us. And, and in homosexuality, it just doesn't work. The, uh, the sort of metaphor doesn't work, and, and God really intended it to, to be uh, you know, a certain design, um, one man, one woman, for life. Um, in order for us to get a taste of what God's love is. And so when that's, when it's tainted, you, that's, that's ruined. But, you know, at the same time, we look at the comment that, um, that Alan makes, he says, um, when he came out of, about his homosexuality, when he was 25, his father initially rejected him. He says, it was a long time before my dad could look me square in the eyes again. I wanted his acceptance so desperately, and I was afraid I was never going to get it. Now looking back, I realize that same relationship, father-son, is often how we define our relationship with God. I use my relationship with dad to identify God. I believe God was this big, mean, scary guy who could never love me, and I could never earn his acceptance, so why even try? And he says his father eventually came to accept him again. When I realized he still loved me, that changed my relationship with God. Now I have a great relationship with my dad and with God. And see, casting someone out and saying, you know, in this case, well, you know, you're no son of mine or, or whatever like that um, because of of this sinful temptation or even because they embrace it and, and don't believe that it's sinful. That's sinful, too. Because here they're looking for the love of Christ in the people that God has put in their lives, um, that, that were specifically put in their lives to love them. And dad wasn't doing that. And, and look at the destructive effect that it had. Here he's, he wants to know what God the Father is like, and so he looks at his earthly father. Right? That is just as much a sin as it is to, um, y- you know, to ruin that husband-wife uh, you know, the, the, the sort of bride of Christ, um, uh, uh, analogy as well. I mean, it's, it's, you, you could, it's not the same sin in the sense that it's the same commandment, but the, the effect is the same. Right. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because he, he really, you know, these people who really does want to seem to fo- try to fault God, you know, he says, um, you know, his, his, when it comes to you know what the Bible says, it's like I don't pretend the Scripture doesn't say what it says about homosexuality. I don't have the intellectual and theological background to enter a debate, but I know there's lots of scriptures I can read and, and come up with fear. I know there's a lot I I can read and aren't aspects of my life. Um, you know, it's interesting, but he's really you know trying to 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 to, to work this through. Uh, he really does want to follow God in this, and. Um, you know, he, I kind of like that, is in the three and a half years I've been loving, committed to my partner, the fruit of that end of my sexuality is beauty, love, and goodness, not fear and destruction. The fruit that was born of my alcoholism was fear and destruction. Um, and, uh, you know, which again, he, again, 
I think he's wrong, but it's interesting the way he's at least trying to struggle with it, trying to fit it all together. Um, to 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 your note there, Dale, I like the very end of this. He says, uh, maybe I don't have all the answers, but I can choose to love my brother. You know, we can choose to show God's love to people. You know, this, this totally goes back to what I said at the beginning of the show about um, about women pastors. Right, which is actually related to this whole thing on a on a different level, um, but it's it's a matter of we all struggle with sin, we all give in to sin, and quite frankly, we all are confused about one thing or another when it comes to theology. All right, I don't pretend to have it all figured out. That's I mean that's why I came up with that whole gum thing. All right. Because there are certain things that I don't understand, and I have a theological degree, right? And um, and and there are things that I don't think I'll ever understand. And every once in a while, I'll get new insight. Every once in a while, I'll come across something and I'll go, you know what? I didn't really have that quite right before, you know. And um, and and I think I better understand it now. And and you know, maybe I was even wrong about some stuff. And uh, that's just the reality of being a, a fallen human being. You know, it's, <laughs> it's one of the things I'm really looking forward to about um, about heaven, about the resurrection, is being able to go to God and say, all right, can you explain this bit to me? Because, you know, or, or, you know, did I have this right or, or whatever? You know, I don't know, maybe we won't need to at that point because we won't be fallen anymore. Um but, you know, just to, to be able to get those insights and, and not have them confused, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to spending eternity wrapping my brain around this stuff. Reach for the sky! Well, I think it, um, it's, it's probably easy to deal with some of the stuff in the abstract. The problem is to be when you're dealing with real people. And, uh, you know, how do I apply this to a real person, a person who's really struggling? And, uh, you know, we want, we, we have to bring the law to bear where it's necessary. But we also want to try to, to work it so they can still hear the gospel. Yeah. But it's hard. Yeah, it doesn't help to just, like, throw some Latin at them or something like that. I've had people do that to me. I had a, you know, legitimate question about some teaching. And I was really struggling with it. <laughs> he threw a Latin phrase at me, and I went, "Huh? <laughs> this doesn't help me, you know." And I mean, theology is worthless if it doesn't work when the rubber hits the road. And that's something I've always liked about uh, Lutheran theology is that, um, boy, you know what? I can apply it, and uh, and it, it works. And I mean, I'll, you know, other people are going to say, "Well, you know, our theology works that way too." Okay, you know, great. But, um, you know, it's been very helpful to me to be able to actually find answers to life, to life's questions. I've got, I've got an awesome confirmation class this year. It's just two kids, but they just, I, I, I try to get through the lesson. They keep throwing questions at me. We've met twice so far, both times at 10 after when we were supposed to stop. I said, all right, <laughs> enough questions for one night. Your parents are waiting outside for you. And. My family's waiting at home for me. Save your questions. We'll discuss it next time. You know, and, and they've got all these questions, you know, and it's great. And it's great being able to discuss those things and to answer those questions. And, you know, because the reality is that, um, theology and reality, they, they're, you know, they're one and the same. Theology is reality. Uh, if your theology is accurate and, um, and it should be able to, to work. In reality, and if it doesn't, um, you've got one of two things: either you just don't understand the theology properly, um, you know, or, or you don't, you can't find the right theological, uh, you know, teaching to uh, to apply to a given situation, um, or else you know your theology is wrong, and and you need to rethink it and rework it and go back to the Bible and study and study and study some more. Um, and, and not just sit and study, but discuss it with people. And, um, you know, what, how do you deal with this? How do, how do you understand 
what God has to say to us regarding this topic. That's the beauty of, and I'll, I'll plug, um, since I'm making plugs tonight, I'll plug going to your, uh, your Bible classes that your church offers. If you can't make them, go to some other ones. Or that'll get me in trouble too. But, you know, be in the Word. Talk to your Christian friends. You know, if, if you can't find a, a regular organized Bible study at a church, all right, get together with some Christian friends, you know, um, have a, a couple of beers or sodas or something and, you know, and, and just sit around and, and, uh, either take a look at some news stories like we do and, and, um, and talk about what does the Bible say about this or, um, you know, or just, find some interesting texts or, you know, or whatever, but Hey, get in the word. And it's just, you know, it's, it's a great thing. And so, and, and be sharing it with others because faith does not, um, thrive in a vacuum. It needs to be, you know, iron sharpens iron. You need to take that faith and share it with others, not only as a sort of outreach evangelism idea, but in building your own by sharing it with others. You know, today I had a really great conversation with, a, um, with an ELCA female pastor. And you know what? I learned some stuff. I got some fresh perspectives and I didn't agree with everything she said, but man, I, I, she gave me some stuff to think about and I'm going to be thinking about it for a long time. And I may even, you know, have future discussions with her to bounce some of these ideas around. Okay. Well, enjoy chewing your gum. That's all I can tell you. That kind of brings us to everything tonight. Again, if you got any comments, if you think Dale needs to go chew something else besides his gum, uh, you got comments for his um, thoughts and stuff tonight. If you wonder what those purple things are coming through my skin, uh, you can just uh, email us at podcast at crossfadenews.com. Love to have your comments or comment on YouTube or Click on this thing and take you to uh, the iTunes podcast store. If you're watching it in iTunes, any of those ways you can give a comment, or you can always drop by the website and comment there. Um, and of course, we would really, uh, if you want to drop by the website and look at the stories, comment on those right there. Post uh, some we, stories. We kind of choose the stories. Yeah, I'll post some stories. We 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 are always interested in what other in different stories out there. Um, you know, Dale does a lot of stories through Google searches. Um, I do, I come up with a lot of them through, uh, uh, looking at Christianity Today and links that they have. And so I just kind of forward them on to ours. So there's, there's different ways to do it. So if you find something that looks interesting, please put it up there. Um, once I get a lot of click throughs, we'll use it, use during the week. Yep. So thanks for everybody for tuning in and, uh, um, Good night, everybody, and God bless.